so th this is that time scale of the lake sediments that I turned on its side. And we're looking at a time period that's right here, um, which is uh, coeval with this um, habitation horizon. And this time period um, is about 1.84 uh, million years ago. It's actually a kind of a complicated stratigraphy, but it's sort of a package of stacked paleosols capped by this tuff. And you'll notice that it's during a C4 period, and we're in, in, and therefore suggesting it's an extremely dry period. And that's consistent with the fact that the lake was really contracted. So it was you know, not an expansive lake, but a really small lake, probably because the climate was dry. So it's a dry period. And it's one of our most C4 strong signals um, in the record. So the archaeologists, hard at work, scraping off the surfaces, looking for bones, based on the work that Mary Leakey did 50 years ago. Uh, this is a kernel density estimate of the abundance of the, the debris. And a lot of it is um, like tools and then vertebrates that have been butchered. And there's like little nick marks and cut marks on the bones that show human activity or hominid activity um, processing those bones. And the big debate that has, uh, yeah, oh, sorry, I'll orient you. Here's a map of this, this wiggly thing here is the gorge itself. This is a bird's eye view. And that's been cut out by streams. And then the perennial lake is interpreted to have been here. And then we're near that lake. And this is the more extended uh, lake. So we're on this what was a lake bed has now become a soil. And so one of the debates that the archaeologists have had with each other, and I tell you what, those people like to debate with each other, is um, scavenger versus hunter. Were these bones sort of drugged together and then processed, or did they hunt them? That's, that's an open question that I'm not going to necessarily uh, comment on. But one of the, one of the other, and, oh, and there's, because there's ambiguous evidence, there's both cut marks from tools, and there's also carnivore you know, puncture marks in the bones as well. So probably some combination of the both. But the, the question that has sort of plagued people is, why is there so much concentrated in this area and so much less in these other realms? Is there something about that spot that's important that we should know about? Why are they leaving all of their dinner trash, their McDonald's wrappers, and everything else right there, right? And so we measured where uh, this is a, a composite of multiple trenches, and so we've sort of reconstructed the physical or the spatial relationship to each other, but each of these sites actually represents different, different localities. And we reconstructed, we met in each, Gale and, and Clay uh, got samples from each of these sites and then measured um, the leaf wax 13C, which is shown in this diagram, and then interpreted based on our model the percent of woody cover at these different sites. And you can see right where those fossils were, we get the lowest isotope values, and we're interpreting from our, our uh, framework the woodiest spot. So they were hanging out in the woods, eating their dinner, butchering their, whether carcasses or prey. And there's actually some evidence of juvenile hominids in this site. So maybe there were vulnerable populations and some social structure. And so it's this is thought by the archaeologists to be kind of the beginning of um, social interactions, right, in, in associated with food resources. So they had dinner together, right? Maybe breakfast. I don't know. And then maybe, and you can speculate why they would be in the in the in the woody vegetation. Um, one of the things that could give you is just thermal protection, right? It's hot, it's sunny. You can be in the shade. That's kind of good. It could give you physical protection from predators that might be more prevalent in the open environments. That kind of, so you can imagine. Um, uh, possible explanations for that. But we can show with some certainty that the concentration of the bones is not an accident. It's actually in the woody realm. But that's an alkanes. So that's not entirely convincing. So we went and looked for woody material uh, in, the, in the preserved organics. And we, we looked for lignin products. Lignin is the structural tissue of wood. It's also, also present in leaves. There's like this. I love this little picture of a leaf on the right or on the left here, that's the lignin left behind when the insects ate all the juicy stuff. So there's a little bit of lignin in, in structural, as structural tissues and leaves. It, um, but it has a different chemical property than the woody lignin, so we can distinguish those. And um, those are what's shown here. I'm not going to belabor that, but I, I just want to say that we have uh, the ratio of these different structures. Ooh, it's not on. Wrong one. The ratio of these different structures can distinguish angiosperms from gymnosperms. and um, uh, woody from non-woody. 
uh, which is non-woody on the right and woody on the left. That's an old uh, biomarker technique. It's been around a long time. And we thought, well, wouldn't it be fun if we measured isotopes on these lignans, which is not a simple measurement, but we did it. And we can show that they track this, um, uh, I, the, the, the 13C of the phenol track the biomarker, the, the leaf wax biomarker. So we see that kind of relationship. And we see that the ratio of these uh, structures from woody to non-woody, um, woody over here, non-woody over here, shows that same gradient. So we have multiple lines of evidence that it's vegetation in that, that's woody in that central area. And when we put together uh, that information, there's the woods. Uh, and then these outer areas here to the south are grassy signatures in every way we look at it. And then what's really interesting is in the north, there's a, with some proximity, these, these sites are, uh, look like aquatic influence. So there's a wetland environment. And there's some fossil fish the, and debris and some bird debris that support that. Um, and so there's an open, open setting here, a woody setting that's not too far from a wetland that was probably fed by a freshwater spring, so potable water. The lake itself was probably not drinkable or potable, but the freshwater spring would have been. So these folks were not so dumb, right? They picked a shady spot near some water, or they had some protection, and had their dinner. So the butchery activity in the woods suggests what is hypothesized as a central foraging uh, behavior typical of social predators, people, organisms that work together in a predatory fashion. One of the other things that we did, I'm not going to go through all the details, but we measured a bunch of biomarkers from this area. And there's, there's actually a fair amount of isotopic diversity in these wetland plants. And that's shown uh, just in a, yeah, you guys are getting ready for lunch, I think, right? So there's some, oh, yes, the fern, there's, the, there's Chris, right? Was yeah. yeah, there you go, fiddleheads. Um, and we can measure different molecules that approximate different um, or represent different types of vegetation. And we see quite a range of isotope values from minus 23 to uh, low or mid minus 30. So there's some isotopic variability in the, in the diet that was available through the, the wetland. And so that, that informs, I don't think it constrains, but informs uh, hypotheses about dietary um, sources for these organisms. So based on the tooth enamel, uh, which has been modified back to a, a diet value, um, you know, there's a C4 vegetation. It's probably pretty important in this one, whether it was through eating grass directly or meat. I'll leave to the archaeologists to figure out based on wear patterns on the teeth. Um, and then the C3 vegetation, there's the trees themselves. Sedges and ferns have the nice light values. But these aquatic macrophytes that we also measured show these intermediate values. And maybe they were eaten, or maybe little turtles that ate the macrophytes were eaten. Like, there could have been a trophic story there. So we're, we're arguing that the Homo habilis Value, intermediate value could represent a wide diversity of foodstuffs. All right. So that's our old of I story. And I'm going to um, skip a little bit of deuterium because of the interest of time. Let's see how many slides do I have. Yeah. You, yeah. Question. Yes. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Like, that's like where they get so many of their, their fossil collections. It's all because of literally leopards and like dropping out. Of Drop, th yeah, so that's so interesting. That would explain the consistency or the inconsistency in the observation of pun puncture marks from teeth and cutting, cutting marks on the same material. That's what we call in the, in the microbial oceanography realm, we call that sloppy feeding or sloppy eating. And the, there's a lot of debris when cells are ruptured that gets released to the environment. So it's kind of an analogous and a vertebrate. I love that. That's great. I had not heard of that. Yeah. So, so maybe they were under the trees because there was food raining down on their heads. And she said, well, I'm assuming they were going to be there while the leopards were there, too. One would hope not, <laughs> at least not with your children. <laughs> right? It's, they're dumpster diving. <laughs> All right. So do you got, it's getting a little late, but I think we'll, we'll get through what we can of deuterium. And so um, we'll see how far we get. And I'll just introduce the idea of leaf waxes as carriers of deuterium signals from uh, hydrologic variability. 
So we have rainfall. It has some composition. It can vary widely over the landscape. Uh, it gets into the soil and then gets picked up by the plants and then eventually biosynthetically ends up on our leaf waxes. And what we're interested in is the relationship between the precipitation value and the leaf waxes, but there's this whole pathway of uh, process that you have to go through and try and get your ha hands around in order to make that interpretation. Um, and more complicated representations of that relationship are shown here. I think this is from the Sasha article where you have precipitation and then you might have soil water that's evaporated from your precipitation and then xylem water may or may not be evaporated into leaf water which may or may not be incorporated into your leaf lipid. And so in our calibration studies in the modern environment, we're often measuring these and measuring this, and then we have this fractionation factor, but it's an apparent or a net fractionation factor that sort of buries behind it all of this other sort of sets of processes. Um, Brett is in the house. There he is. So here's his paper. Uh, Brett has done some really nice work on sort of looking at uh, seasonal um, signals and how they might and variability in the deuterium content of the precipitation, how, when and how it might get incorporated into the leaf waxes. And he showed that there's a, a leaf flush period where the signal is sort of picked up by the lipids and then it's maintained through the season. So it seems to be, a, a, in this particular study, associated with the, the production of the leaf itself. There's some debate as to whether the lipids are replaced over time. Uh, maybe they would pick up later seasonal signals. My, my experience with the sediment record is that it's really a wet season signal and it's a growth growth signal. So that's the N-alkanes. There are other compounds out there that carry hydrogen. Um, they're not so widely used in paleoclimate studies, but they're out there. And one of the important classes are these uh, branched isoprenoids. Um, and isoprenoids uh, have a really different isotope behavior than the uh, linear alkanes. This is from a nice review article by Alex Sessions, where the alkanes have these depleted values about 100 to minus 200 per mil, where the alkane the, and the isoprenoids have maybe three or 350 uh, per mil depletion relative to the source water. So they're very strongly uh, uh, depleted, and that reflects the different biochemistry in their synthesis and the source of hydrogen to the structure. Um, and there's some uh, uh, the corresponding variability between the alkane version and the acid version. Sometimes they're, they, they overlap pretty well, and sometimes not so much. Here it's not so much. And so um, it's important if you're going to use fatty acids and alkanes in the same study from the same locality that you try to get samples where they both occur and try and calibrate their relationship in that study environment. And, and also you need to tell your readers what compound represents which data point so we can um, recognize that. Um, we noticed a long time ago, and others have picked this up as well, that the um, alkane values don't seem to change when you bury and heat them. But the isoprenoid values do. And so they start out really different from the alkanes, as I showed you here. And then as you go to higher thermal maturity or higher heating in the geologic environment, they actually kind of come up and vary and match the, the, uh, the alkane signal. So you lose the biological signal, and it becomes enriched. And as we speculated, and others have now shown that the, this is related to isotope exchange on the branch structures is easy, more easily done than on the linear structures. And Alex uh, Sessions' article here again reviews some of these mechanisms which I've shown here that kind of give us the possible ways that this can take place. So one of the important things is that as molecules are buried in the geologic record and subjected to heat, they begin to change their shape uh, to a to slightly lower energy configuration. And in so doing, they sometimes move their hydrogens around. And in that, under those circumstances where you have uh, geometric changes, you also are having hydrogen changes. And that's where the exchange can take place. And you kind of reset and lose your primary signal. So there is definitely an exchange problem that can limit our uh, ability to study these compounds in deep geologic timescales. OK, so let's assume we've got some preserved stuff that's not been scrambled by this process. Uh, and then we want to interpret the water environment from our N-alkanes. Well, we have to be mindful that woody plants and herbaceous plants and, sea and grasses have different fractionation factors uh, between the water and the, and the uh, lipid in the vegetation. There's, a, there's some big error bars on here because there's a lot of noise in the environment 
in our modern calibration studies, but there is a, sort of mean difference uh, between them. So we again try to take that, those differences and incorporate that into our interpretive framework. And that's shown here. So those are the same values that are on the previous slide. And then we just use that scale of the types of vegetation that we think we had at Olduvai um, and apply this, this sort of function that represents an epsilon of fractionation between the water and the environment and the lipid, actually I should go down, the water and the environment and the lipid, uh, based on these different kinds of vegetation. Whenever you apply deuterium to leaf waxes, you should always make some effort, and this may not be the best way for your application, but this worked for us, but you should have some way to reconstruct the type of vegetation so that you can characterize the fractionation factor. Remember, deltas are too simple. You need a fractionation factor to interpret them, and it's hard to estimate, and if you're doing it, doing interpretations without estimating the kind of vegetation, you could be seriously misleading yourself. So be careful about that. 